Let's take a close look at question two from the July 2024 California Bar Exam. First thing I see is that it has two calls. First call, what property interest, if any, does Darla have in lot B? So that's a pure property call. Call two, what claims may Simon make to maintain a right of way over lot B to the new public highway? That is asking about an easement. So I think this is a pure property hypothetical. The only other thing it could be, in my experience with a whole bunch of fact patterns, would be some kind of a crossover with wills or trusts, depending on how Darla acquired her interest in Lot B. Sometimes the bar gives us that kind of a crossover. What I am pretty sure about is that Call 2 is about easements. So let's take a look at the facts. Olivia owned Greenacre in Fee Simple. Greenacre consisted of two unimproved adjoining lots, Lot A and Lot B. A dirt road led from Lot A across Lot B to a public highway. And that is the road that's the subject of Call 2. Sixty years ago, Olivia conveyed Lot B to Barry as a gift subject to the following clause. If at any time Barry, his heirs, successors, or assigns shall use the premises for any purpose other than as a personal residence, said Lot B shall immediately vest in fee simple in Zach or his surviving descendants. Okay, so this is a, a condition on the conveyance. So I'm looking at present estates and future estates here. I need to figure out what kind of an estate Barry has been given. Let's take a look at the law I would have memorized and had in my head on the bar exam. So I'm going to proponics and I'm going to open the property schema and I want to look at estates in land. I want to look at present estates and future estates. So start with present estates. And I think what we have here is going to be a defeasible fee. It's an interest that has the, the potential of infinite duration, but it may terminate on the happening of some event. Okay, we've got three kinds, and I need to type this conveyance. It has a condition subsequent. The condition subsequent goes to some third party, and it looks like it's going to automatically go to the third party on the happening of the event. So, what I think we have is not a fee simple subject to a condition subsequent. Look at that. That one doesn't end until the grantor affirmatively demonstrates that he's going to terminate it. I think what we have is a fee simple subject to an executory interest. It automatically divests in a favor of a third party on the happening of some event. Here it's that it's used as anything but a residence. It's limited by durational or conditional language. Here it's conditional. It terminates on the happening of the event and it automatically goes to a third party, not to the grantor. But look at that. It's subject to the rule against perpetuities, which is a big nightmare for most of us studying for the bar exam. And so in my outline, we try to simplify the rule against perpetuities so that you don't spend most of your property study time trying to figure this thing out. I need to open up future estates so that I can see the rule against perpetuities. 
And there we have everything I would be memorizing and understanding about the rule against perpetuities. Everyone memorizes the rule. Everyone, everyone who takes the bar memorizes that rule just in case. So what I'm more interested in is applying the rule. And that gets kind of mind-bending. It gets mind-bending on the MBE, and it looks to me like they're giving us a rule against perpetuities call here, that my analysis is going to hinge on the rule against perpetuities. So I need to figure out whether this thing is going to be, this clause, this conditional language, is going to be held valid by the court. We don't want remote vesting, so what I need to look at is how to analyze the rule. Yeah, I know that if it, there's a chance that it will not vest until 21 years after the, the life of someone in being at the time of the conveyance, then that future interest is going to be held to be invalid. But applying that on the MBE or here as in an essay under the pressure of the bar can be a bit like a math problem for somebody who has math anxiety. So I have some general strategies here for thinking about a future interest, conditional language here in this tab, but I also have some examples that really help me out. Take a look at the third example here. To A, as long as computers are never used on the property, otherwise to B. That's what we have here. It's to Barry, as long as it's used as a residence, Barry, his heirs, and his assigns, but if it's ever used as anything else, then it goes to someone else. That's an executory interest with no time limit for vesting, and it's going to fail. So what I have here is a fee simple subject to an executory interest with remote vesting. And that means that this future interest will be held to be invalid and that that condition will be stricken. What I wind up with is a fee simple absolute to bury. Zach and his heirs have no interest in Greenacre. Do you agree with my analysis here? There's a possibility that Zach's interest would not vest until a hundred years after he dies and everyone else in the fact pattern is dead. That means it fails. It is not a valid executory interest because it violates the rule against perpetuities. Let's go back to the hypothetical. Barry has been conveyed a gift, and it goes on to say, shortly after receiving title, Barry began living in a cottage he built on lot B. That's telling you that he is living on it in accordance with the condition in the conveyance. but. I have decided that that condition is invalid, and what Barry really has is a fee simple absolute. So go on. At the time of the conveyance of Lot B, Zach had not yet had any children. Zach has since died, and his granddaughter Darla is now his only surviving descendant. That is the person in call one. What property interest, if any, does Darla have in Lot B? As of this point, I think Darla has no property interest in Lot B because the executory interest was invalid due to it violating the rule against perpetuities. But we have a lot more facts to go. Maybe they'll give me something that will let me raise adverse possession. Let's see. Thirty years ago, Olivia died. Her son, Simon, inherited Lot A. He built a house on Lot A one year later. Through the years, Simon regularly used the dirt road across Barry's adjacent Lot B to get to and from his house and the public highway because there was no other access. There he is establishing an easement.
I'm going to need to tell the grader what kind of an easement Barry holds and what his rights are because call B asks what claims may Simon make to maintain a right of way over lot B to the public highway. So let's take a look at the law on easements. Back to proponics, to non-possessory interests, and to easements. Here we go. I need to know the characteristics. I need to tell the grader that this is an easement appurtenant. It's tied to the land. I want all the points I can get on this call. Analyzing easements is pretty straightforward. So how about creation? It's not an express easement. It's an easement by implication or by necessity or by prescription. Let's take a look at all of those. By implication needs a common grantor, previous use, reasonably necessary, and the owner has retained one of the parcels. Now, they tell us that Olivia owned both of those parcels. The, the B parcel, which is the one conveyed as a gift, and the A parcel. She retained the A parcel when she gave Barry the gift. So it seems to me that I need to analyze by implication. What about by necessity? Common grantor, easement necessary for the dominant estate, continuous use. This one generally involves a landlocked piece of property and we have that here. So I would analyze by necessity as well. What about by prescription? Open, hostile, actual. I'd analyze by prescription as well. Now, you can form an easement here in a fairly straightforward way. What about rights? The servient estate may not obstruct the dominant's right to use the easement. That's what I expect to see coming up in the fact pattern. Somebody is going to try to block his reuse of that road. Transfer of the servient estate subjects the new owner to the easement. It's probably going to be transferred to someone else. If the dominant estate is sold, the easement goes with it. All of these rules. It can't be terminated for non-use. I would have memorized all of this and I'd be looking at the facts to see what part of it I need to analyze. You always need to analyze how the easement was formed and what type it is. And generally, someone tries to block the easement. Okay, back to the facts. We've got a paragraph to go. Let's see who tries to block it. Next paragraph says, four months ago, Barry sold lot B to developer for a million dollars. Lot B, that's the one that was gifted to Barry. And the easement goes with it. Developer demolished the cottage, began constructing an office building on the lot, and began closing off access to the dirt road from Simon's house. All right, building the office building, that would violate the condition in the conveyance to Barry, but I already decided that that condition, that executory interest, is invalid because it violates the rule against perpetuities. So under my analysis, it doesn't matter that an office building is being built there. Barry owned a fee simple absolute. He sold it. The easement goes with the land was a valid sale and that easement exists and developer is stuck with it and cannot block access to the road. So in that last paragraph we have facts that go to call one and to call two. And I think that 
a lot of bar candidates will have analyzed this to say, well, it would have violated the rule against perpetuities, except that it did vest, and so it's okay. But that's not my understanding of the rule against perpetuities. If it's possible for it to vest remotely more than 21 years after a life in being, then it's an invalid executory interest and it's stricken from the conveyance. I see no facts that would let Darla claim any part of Lot B. There are no facts that go to adverse possession and that executory interest is invalid, so Darla has no interest in Lot B. As to the easement, developer cannot block the road. I would have explained to the grader how the easement was formed. I have three theories under which the easement was formed. And the trickiest part about deciding how that easement was, was created is remembering that when you look at actual constructive or record notice, you're going to find constructive notice virtually always. And that's what that fact about the road being obvious there was about. Form the easement. Tell the grader that when the servient estate is conveyed, the easement goes with the property. It remains intact. And then conclude that that's how Simon may maintain a right of way over lot B to the public highway. So now, what if your analysis of the rule against perpetuities and the conclusion you reached on that call one didn't match mine? Are you going to be in real jeopardy as far as the score goes? No. The fact that you see the rule against perpetuities and you analyze it, even if you came to a different conclusion, means that you're not going to suffer in score. If my analysis is incorrect, I would say the same thing. What would be a real detriment to your score would be if you didn't realize that there was a rule against perpetuities analysis needed here. That would cost you points. So look, property is a huge subject and it's really intimidating to think that you're going to have to memorize everything about property for the bar exam, but you saw how little law I would actually memorize in each of these topics. This is doable. You just have to get your outline down to the basic points and understand them well, and then you can memorize it. And understanding comes well before memorization. We have links to our Patreon account and to Power Law, which is where you will find Proponics in the description below. And thanks for hanging in there till the very end here.